The world can't be described by single metrics in isolation. If you want to harness the power of prediction, you have to understand the ways in which your data is interdependently connected. Welcome, friends and foes, to another data devotional, the first in a four-part mini-series on descriptive data analysis. I'm Luciano Pesci, founder and CEO of Imperitas and Nexum, and the data problem that we're starting to discuss today is that the world cannot be explained by single metrics alone. To this point, the analysis that we have done has focused on single metrics, fields, variables, whatever you want to call them, in isolation, one at a time. This is the process of exploratory data analysis. And this is an important requisite step before you can fully describe the data. But we have to move past EDA because it's very cookie cutter in nature. In fact, you could apply automation to everything that we've done to this point and would lose almost none of the importance. One exception being the analyst notes that are scattered throughout the EDA script, which in the case of Silverman, I'm happy to announce is complete. You can access the full R project file with the entirety of the EDA here at the first of these two links. The second link will take you to the public facing Power BI dashboard, which roughly has one page per question from the survey laid out for a total of 87 pages in the dashboard. The automation of the EDA is effectively done in the case of Silverman. As we field additional surveys, we can feed those results into the same pipeline and all of the visuals will update. So while this is a requisite step, it is not one that requires a lot of deep thought. You're going metric by metric, looking at individual patterns. Now you need to step back and look at patterns across the entire data set. Once you move into a world of multivariate analysis, things get more complicated. The idea that the world is multivariate had two important contributions made around the 20th century. The first is the Pareto principle from Vilfredo Pareto, also known as the 80-20 rule. I've linked to the original paper, it is in French, good luck. The second came from Sir Ronald Fisher and I've linked to a proceedings reprint from 1966 of his original remarks. Best I can tell, these two contributions set us on the path to analysis of variance, which is the foundation of most of multivariate analysis. What Pareto suspected and then Fisher later proved was that to explain any one thing in the world, you need to divide it up into its component parts. Like EDA, Descriptive data analysis requires that you understand what kind of data you have and the measurement of that data. Like before, you're going to take that information and go to a toolbox to retrieve the most appropriate tool for the process you are looking to complete. We're not going to a handheld toolbox like we were with EDA. Descriptive data analysis is like going to a tool cabinet. And every year, the number of tools that you have available to choose from to put into that cabinet goes up. Also like EDA, descriptive data analysis is a requisite step. You're going to take everything that you learned about individual metrics during the EDA, and now you're going to understand how that metric is connected to the rest of the data set. And EDA combined with DDA is building towards predictive modeling. Let's connect the problem of a multivariate world with the types of analysis available to you in your tool cabinet. I'm only going to present the most common tools that are available for tests of similarity and tests of difference, specifically cross tabs, correlation, mean difference tests, t-tests, and ANOVAs. After this, I will also touch on some of the common approaches that we end up using all the time that don't really fall into predictive modeling and don't really fall into descriptive analysis. We call them the gray area tests. All of these are going to be covered in detail along with their coding in R and some of it in Power BI in this mini series of devotionals. But I'll briefly take you through each of these right now. Tests of similarity are very straightforward. The most common of these are cross tabs and correlation analysis. One of the reasons for this is that any metric that you have of any measurement type can always be dumbed down into categorical data, which means you can always run cross tabulation. Typically categorical data is going to be described through cross tabulations and continuous data is going to be described through correlations. There are correlation methods for categorical data, but you have to know whether you're using nominal data or ordinal data. Little side note on this slide, one of the least used methods of correlation that I think is really powerful is partial correlation. When you look at a traditional correlation output, you are looking at the correlation between two metrics. There are other things that are affecting both metrics that you're looking at with the correlation and partial correlation can pull that out. So that what you're left with is as pure as possible, a correlative power between the two metrics involved. In the scientific method, tests of similarity are of a lesser order of evidence than tests of difference. You can see this in the way that t-tests have been elevated to the top of the food chain in academic literature. This is all based on the principle of falsifiability. I've provided a link on the slide to an article about the power of falsifiability in the scientific method, but this is the core of what science does. It does not show what something is through tests of similarity. It shows what something is not through tests of difference and specifically through falsifiability. And then it repeats this process over and over to validate and revalidate that what you're seeing is a real pattern. 
and not the result of random chance or bad sampling or other things that can affect it. Tests of difference can involve different combinations of measurement in metrics, so you can have continuous data and categorical data simultaneously. The t-tests, certain types of t-tests require this. We will go over in the future devotional what the difference is between a one-sample, two-sample independent, and two-sample dependent or paired t-test is. I'm also going to cover Mood's median test, which is a non-parametric method that you, that you can use with categorical data. And we'll cover ANOVAs, which are just an extension of these t-tests when you have more than two groups that you're trying to understand the differences between. I will not, however, go into the various forms of ANOVA analysis. I will just show the traditional ANOVA, but, but depending on the kinds of data that you have and the number of metrics that you want to use, there are a long list of ANOVA type analyses that are available to you. But for me, anything beyond a two or maybe three way ANOVA, and I'm just going to use regression analysis. What about the gray area? These are some of the most powerful tests that are available and and the term test here is a little bit misleading because some of these do not have the kind of output that's required, like a p-value, to run a formal test. Instead, you just get the output and you don't really have a confidence measurement to understand how well the output reflects the population. It would require multiple devotionals on any one of these topics to do them full justice. So instead, we will do all of them in one of the devotionals that's coming up in this mini-series by providing the code and walking you through it, but it will be on you to go and master these concepts if they're of interest to you. So it's best to understand these gray area tests from a first principles standpoint, because the specific names and types of tests are going to be rapidly changing. Let's review the roadmap that we're going to use to solve the descriptive data analysis problem with each of the methods that we've just connected it to. Since the descriptive data analysis that we're going to do is more complex than the EDA, it opens the door for a lot of other issues. Each of these that I have listed is something that can go wrong when you're dealing with multivariate analysis. With spurious correlation, you can see patterns that aren't real. This happens a lot. You can have omitted variable bias, where the absence of specific metrics is misleading you. You could have endogeneity, where the metrics that you're using are interdependent. You could have intertemporal stochasticism, meaning things, patterns change over time. What's true in this period is not true in a future period. And the good old type 1 and type 2 errors, false positives and false negatives. And since it's virtually a guarantee that you're dealing with a sample of data from the totality, think back to your most data definition, one of the final issues is that you might just have a bad sample. And if you're not running post hoc tests, you might look at that sample, believe it to be correct, act on it, and make the wrong decisions. The absence of post hoc tests is one of those things in the private sector that shocked me coming out of academia. It is standard practice with statistical analysis to run post hoc tests when you're doing any kind of published research. Because if you don't, you'll immediately be challenged on the idea, is what you're looking at the result of random chance? Or is this a sample that is likely to reflect the population or unlikely to reflect the population? The answer to this riddle might be contained in the types of errors that people care about, type one versus type two. For example, businesses are often much more concerned about a type two error than a type one error. You don't want to miss the opportunity to solicit to a customer, but you're fine talking to someone who's a non-customer. Post hoc tests, like anything, are pretty easy to run in statistical software packages. You just have to be committed to doing them, but they do come at a trade-off. You reduce the likelihood of making a compounding type 1 error, but you increase the likelihood of making a type 2 error. But the purpose of the post hoc is to help you ahead of time validate that what you're doing is going to work. Another way of doing this is to just do A-B testing over time. Set up hypotheses, run tests, check your hypotheses over time, and validate, revalidate, and update. This is rarely cost-benefit positive. Post hoc tests provide a much cheaper way of doing this, but the business world has definitely adopted the approach of A, B, test your way to a solution instead of using post hoc tests on samples. During the DDA process, you will find things that make you reevaluate what you were seeing and what you were saying in the EDA. Pass that information back into the system. Take what you're learning, go back to the source and update it, so that as others go through your EDA at some point in the future, they already have the benefit of your previous DDA at the same time. The most important example of this that I can think of is multimodality. Whenever you're seeing multimodality in a single metric, it means there's something about that distribution that could be divided. There's two populations there. And descriptive data analysis will show you that. In the context of the Silverman survey, it can show you how things like satisfaction differ by agent type or how it differs on their perceptions of the future prospects of the US economy. If you go digging through the final Silverman survey EDA, you will see that I call out multimodality all the time. That's a note for me to come back and update it once I figure out what's going on. Because undoubtedly, as I start to divide those different distributions by other metrics, I will figure out how they differ. Then I'll go back to my notes and link to the DDA that explains the multimodality. Multimodality is definitely something I'm gonna cover in each of these parts. Dealing with Pareto distributed metrics is another. 
But part two is going to show you how I prepare for DDA. This is a process that I'm going through right now for the Silverman survey, where I'm taking the different metrics and the data types, and I'm putting them into lists that I'm going to use to select from for the types of analysis I plan to run, the tests of similarity, the tests of difference, and the gray area tests, which I call collectively data detective work. In part three, we'll go deep into tests of similarity and tests of differences. So we'll run cross tabs, we'll run correlation tables, we'll run t-tests, and we'll run ANOVAs. Then in part four, we'll cover the gray area tests. We'll do text analysis, dimension reduction, and do some clustering. All of these will be posted in the upcoming weeks to the data devotional playlist linked here on the slide. And all of this is setting the stage for where we're ultimately going, which is predictive modeling. Like in our qual and quant data devotional, where I said 80% of the work is the qualitative stuff that everybody skips, the same thing applies here with predictive modeling. EDA and DDA are 80% of the work that you should be doing when building predictive models. You need to understand your data. You need to understand missing data. You need to understand outliers. You need to deal with outliers. And DDA is gonna introduce a new problem, which is dealing with low or no variance. But these are requisite steps that people regularly skip on their way to predictive modeling. Without a doubt, this is the fastest growing area of applied analytics. There was a huge explosion of this around machine learning, but even traditional regression models have experienced rapid growth in applied approaches. And we'll go to the real fringe of this when we move to simulation modeling after predictive modeling, which is what you do in a situation where you want to understand the future, but you don't have the data historically to go off. Of. Keep your own descriptive data analysis progress going by reading about the different tests of similarity and difference that we're going to cover in the remaining three devotionals in this mini series. And I'll see you at the next one.